Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for being here in this session. Uh, as we follow uh, this second day, that is really packed with many, many things. And I have to say personally that this session is quite special for me, and I think it's going to be uh, really uh, interesting one for many, many reasons. Uh, we've been talking a lot uh, throughout the whole conference, and today especially about uh, the ecosystems of cities, how they operate, the diversity that we need to protect in them, how uh, we cannot uh, simplify them with models that somehow cancel many of a lot of the richness or messiness of we talk. And, and I think this presentation is going to completely expand on that, but from probably a bit unexpected point of view, looking not only about what uh, is the role and the importance of preserving human culture, but also uh, the interaction of human culture and human life with other forms of life in the human environment. Uh, if you know our speaker, uh, probably there's not much that I have to say. If you don't know her, I have to say that Natalia Jeremijenko is really, I think, probably one of the uh, figures that best e exemplifies uh, the position of the artist as, as a researcher and an engineer, uh, an investigator who can operate in the space of art and culture, in the space of science, and, and in the space of society. And why do we need uh, figures like her? Uh, urgently uh, in our current uh, context. Uh, Natalie's been working for more than 20 years in this field, and I think her body of work really exemplifies uh, many of the core ideas that this cultural space has researched for these last two decades. I also have to tell you that this session is going to be a bit special. In a way, it's going to be a session in two parts. Uh, Natalie's keynote is going to develop and explore her work uh, with her uh, current project, the Environmental uh, Health uh, Lab uh, Clinic, the Environmental Health Clinic. And then after this session, uh, during lunch break upstairs in, at floor seven in the cafe, uh, you're going to be able to uh, consult and directly engage with the local environmental health clinic group that exists in Manchester, uh, where you can translate many of your questions, your doubts, and also uh, ask about how can you engage more directly in the work that they're doing. So in a way, we're not going to have uh, questions and discussions because this is going to be somehow offered in the form of one-to-one -one consultations uh, up during the lunch break. So please don't consider that this session stops when it's over, then um, go upstairs to floor seven and continue uh, with this session during lunch break uh, in the spot that uh, the Environmental Health Clinic has set up upstairs. Uh, Thank you a lot, Natalie. It's really a pleasure and a privilege having you here. Thanks for coming. Thank you so much, Jose Luis. It's really a great pleasure to be here, and it's been a really exhilarating conference so far. I'd like to talk to um, the issue that um, Jose had asked me to address, which was urban biodiversity and how we really can or might um, address the complex urban ecosystems on which we critically depend um, that are, as Osman characterized, wicked problems. Although um, I don't know if it's useful to call them wicked. Let's call them something else. I want to start with this image actually in Princess Street um, here in Bristol, uh, which is uh, an old 19th century building, um, slum building. You'll notice that the, uh, that the end of the building hangs out over the water of the river here um, so that the toilets are above and so it just drops directly in. Um, but, uh, you know, that's, that's an interesting way to interface to our natural systems. But um, I would like you to see the two buildings, uh, probably a early 20th century and a, maybe even a 21st century building on either side and have a look at their relationship to the natural system, the river there. Has it transformed radically? No. I mean, it's still this hard edge facing the river that we now know if you want to eutrophify an urban body of water, that's the best way to do it. If you want to, without any wetlands, without any soft shores, without any um, reconstructed shorelines, this is exactly what we shouldn't do. But this is the legacy that we inhabit, and our charge is to reimagine our relationship to natural systems so that we can actually improve our environmental health and our shared um, human health. So let me frame this. Um, uh, I want you to keep that image in mind um, because uh, that's the legacy of engineered urban systems. Uh, and let me present how I frame my work. Um, and the thrill it was to come to um, 
Manchester uh, because uh, Zoe Rosar and a, a gang of really interesting people have initiated a similar um, uh, framework here. So I work as the environmental health clinic, um, which quite um, literally um, twists the definition of health from something that is, let me play that again, um, uh, something that is internal and atomized and individualized to something that is external and shared rather than pharmaceutical or genetically predetermined. It's in the air quality in this room, in the food systems we depend on, in the uh, transportation systems that we use. Um, the good news about that view of environmental health is that, uh, of health, of changing the definition of health to this external view is that uh, we can do something about it. You can't do much about genetic predispositions, uh, but you can, um, and you know, the pharmaceutical approach is, has its limitations. So this is what Keynote recently did to me, which I, uh, I'll have to swap between a couple of uh, things. I like to use Philip Landrigan, kind of uh, his research to um, support this, because he did a survey of um, the, what pediatricians do to um, what they spend their time doing. And I think using children as our canaries it's probably not a good idea, but, um, <laughs> but they are. And uh, so he, he's, uh, he found surveying the pediatricians in um, Manhattan that they spend almost 90, 80 to 90% of their time on treating five top things. Number one is asthma. Number two is developmental delays of all sorts. Um, number three is rare childhood cancers, 400-fold increases that we've seen in the last 15 years. Number four and five are uh, diabetes which is juvenile diabetes and obesity epidemic, and an obesity epidemic in six-month-olds, right? Interesting um, measure of social uh, health. Um, but I'd like to look at the Manchester airport, um, the Manchester Great Air Manchester. Um, just uh, have a look at their latest news. Um, link between air pollution and diabetes, air pollution linked to high blood pressure, Final warning for um, air pollution. Um, uh, some other cheery news about um, how shared environmental health. Um, 50,000 early deaths linked to poor air quality. Okay, so, um, so I would like to suggest that we could, in fact, um, take this shared environmental health uh, and figure out what to do, right? And this is, I think, the insidious crisis that we face that perhaps is more insidious and more pressing than the climate crisis. Um, and that is this crisis of agency, what to do individually, collectively, institutionally, what can we do? And I like to turn to, in fact, I'm going to swap. Thank you, Keynote, for <laughs> being a pain in the butt. I like to turn to animals um, because they have a, um, you know, they have a, a bodily stake in our shared environmental health too, and um, and I trust them more than journalists, in fact. So, um, uh, so and actually, this is an interesting um, study that by this wonderful biostatistician David Allison, who looked at 38 species of non-humans that cohabit with us in our urban environments. Right, this is not wild animals. This is lab rats and pets and um, wild coyote in uh, New York and foxes here and. Um, and looked at these 38 species to see if there was any evidence of the obesity epidemic in, in, um, in them, right? How many spe of those 38 species showed evidence of the urban obesity epidemic? Guesses? 100%, yes, exactly. So this is more than about you going to the gym or what you're eating. This is the environment. Similarly, the five top issues that I said pediatricians were dealing with, they're not the germ theory of health, right? Every single one of those the environment is radically uh, implicated, right? So um, what do we do? Um, I think, um, as I said, we can collaborate on this demand to reimagine our relationship to natural systems by turning to um, organisms. Uh, and this is a, a project called Perch, which uses perches for uh, birds to sit on, furnishing biodiversity, if you will. Um, so when a bird sits on this, do we have the sound up? Uh, it triggers a sound file that says something like this. And here's what you need to do. Go down there and buy some of those health food bars, the ones you call bird food, and bring it here and scatter it around. There's a good person. Okay. 
Um, uh, actually, what, um, what's interesting about this, there's, I set up uh, six in the Whitney Museum Sculpture Court um, and a few other places. Um, each, each of the perches had a different argument, so that effectively the birds could experiment on people, right? What argument best elicits cooperative behavior from the humans below? And the, by in, the, in the Whitney installation where we had six different arguments, another one was you know, the copyright dues for melodic resources borrowed for cell phone ringtones. Um, you know, other rationales. But the one that was about eight to one more popular that the birds decided was the most persuasive way to elicit uh, cooperation from humans was this one. Tick, tick. That's the sound of genetic mutations, of the avian flu becoming a deadly human flu. Do you know what slows it down? Healthy subpopulations of birds, increasing biodiversity generally. It is in your interests that I am healthy, happy, well-fed. Hence, you could share some of your nutritional resources instead of monopolizing them. That is, share your lunch. Okay, so we know it's Biology 101 that we've actually created these, um, you know, uh, we've got the diseases we deserve, right? Avian flu, swine flu, um, associated every a confirmed identification of avian flu was within five kilometers of an industrialized um, farming uh, context. Uh, swine, swine flu, uh, pigs, uh, you know, they are tremendous, you know, if you have a pathogenic virus in a wild uh, context, if it's too pathogenic, it'll kill the animal before it can pass it on, right? So if you put them in these cauldrons of pathogenicity where you take that organism and put it beside someone who's genetically very similar uh, and there's no UV light, a natural sterilizer, the animals are under stress, you create these cauldrons of pathogenicity. So um, we have in our urban food systems um, made some understandable mistakes, but now we know and uh, we are charged with hacking those those food systems, reimagining them, redesigning them, so that we don't um, create these things. Let me show you another food systems interface um, called the Amphibious Architecture Array. Now you can see it's a series of buoys where when fish swim underneath, um, the lights turn on. Um, uh, so this is it being deployed in the East River. It was also deployed in the, um, the Bronx River, which are connected bodies of water. Um, and it begins to suggest, if you remember the first image, of how we might redesign our relationship to natural systems. Uh, the first image of the Bristol. Sorry, where am I? Manchester. <laughs> um, I've, my head is in Bristol as well, I'm sorry. Um, this is... Um, uh, this is the amphibious architecture array. Um, and actually, as we deployed it, there's two levels of lights. There's a top, um, a top level of lights, which is always on, and that shifts from a warm red color when dissolved oxygen or water quality is low to a cool green-blue color when dissolved oxygen is high. Um, and then, of course, as the fish swim under. So the first question that people um, ask is, are there fish in the East River? What are they thinking? Right? Um, and let's see, are there fish in the East River? This is a little bit of um, video. There's a one going across the front. You can see, um, yes, there are fish in the East River. Yes, there are fish in our urban bodies of water. Um, unseen, this becomes a low resolution display of fish presence. So not only can you see that they're there, you can also interact with them. Um, there's business cards down there um, uh, on the site with um, the contact details, um, of the uh, the organisms that are the organisms that are likely to be there have their contact details on the business cards at the site. So you can text these fish, and they will text you back. Um, I just have to say that this is yeah I didn't put him. This is the um, the Bronx River site, um, and uh, by far and away the most popular of the organisms was um, Jose the beaver, um, who was um, he's, he was like you know two million other desperate single males in New York City. He was always texted him and he was texting back saying, you know, you want to come over to my place for a cross-species adventure? I'll show you my lodge, right? Um, so he had about 700 people who uh, wanted daily and weekly updates from him. He's now actually much happier. Um, Justin Beaver has moved in. Um, 
and so he's uh, living happily ever after. Um, although there was a, he had an affair with a, a water rat uh, before that. So um, he's an uh, interesting character. Um, so not only can you interact and text these fish, that's the beginning of an interaction, right? But this issue of transforming our urban actions, our urban interactions, those atomized, individualized actions into something that can aggregate into what we'd call participation, um, begins with the fact that wherever you have urban animals, there's always a sign, do not feed the animals, right? You've got to ask, why not feed the animals? <laughs> why should we monopolize all the nutritional resources? And, and, um, and of course, the received wisdom is that, well, in zoos, um, you know, the animal, uh, that human food is not good for animals, um, and uh, uh, you know it's actually right the you know, the, ba the great sparrow decimation where 90% drop of of the sparrows in in London and New York City uh, sparrows have coexisted with us since for millennia right Macbeth you know there's special providence in the in the fall of a sparrow they've urban animals um, disappeared 90 95% of them gone right major theory is um, their androgenic diet um, high LLD cholesterol right, uh, seems to be, anyway, human food is not good for animals, it's not good for us either, um, but uh, it could be, right, so the lures are um, what we provide, instead of having people throw cigarette butts or, or Doritos or chewing gum, whatever they have to hand, um, into the fish, we provide these lures which are are delicious. Um, they glow in UV um, because they're actually, these are the gin and tonic versions. Um, but they're made of a, a, a gelin, which is an algae derivative. So they're nutritionally appropriate. Um, so you can imagine a school bus full of kids coming up to the amphibious architecture array, feeding them these lures, which are cast in commercial fishing lures. Um, and you actually supplement the the uh, nutritional resources that our hard-edged urban designs have depleted, you know, their, all their nutritional resources, their nursery grounds, their um, salt marshes, and um, and so um, we can share food. Not only can you do that, you can then um, the lures have in them a chelating agent, a medical grade chelating agent, the same that would be administered to you if you had mercury poisoning um, in a hospital. Um, but um, as the fish ingest it, or if you ingest it, this is a cross-species food, um, it binds to the bioaccumulated heavy metals, the PCBs, the mercury, and complexes, passes out in a less reactive form in a salt, where it settles into the silt and is effectively removed from bioavailability, right? So the collective effect of many people interacting with these, taking these interactions, um, can amount, I would argue, to significant collective remediative action. Um, and that's the kind of aggregation, the structure of participation that I'd like to develop a vocabulary around and speak. It's not bottom up, it's not top down. It's actually worth contrasting to what's, the, um, uh, what's going on in the Hudson River, where for the last 30 years with the Clean Water Act and the um, and the Clean Air Act, which followed the UK um, uh, very similar, um, which took 30 years. The PCBs in the Hudson River, the biggest Superfund site in all of the US, um, finally, after 30 years, with legal wrangling and legislative wrangling, GE is cleaning that up, right? So they're dredging, they're getting, <laughs> the contracts have gone to these dredging firms who are dredging the PCBs, resuspending all that contaminant, which has actually been covered with about seven, seven centimetres of silt and has is, is been gradually lowering. Um, and, uh, you know, this huge operation that the community is not involved in, that is not responsive to the hot spots there, and that, I would argue, is this brutal engineering approach, it exemplifies the brutal engineering approach to um, redesigning, re-measuring our relationship to natural systems. So contrast the big bulldozer approach, the big barges resuspending um, silt with um, busloads full of kids feeding the fish, right? Because that sign, do not feed the animals, right? Which is in, I don't know, New York City parks at least three times everywhere. Um, it's only as ubiquitous as the desire to do so, right? 
Um, so this has led to a whole exploration of cross-species food and the launch of the Cross-Species Adventure Club. So the Environmental Health Clinic hosts this Cross-Species Adventure Club to, with the charge very specifically to hack our food systems, right, our shared food systems. Um, so this has been a molecular gastronomy supper club that's run for a couple of years um, in which we explore tongue first food and food systems that not only reduce food miles and reduce pesticide and reduce petrochemical fertilizers, it's, um, you know, reduce the negative damage that our tongues do. And in fact, our, you know, it's interesting thinking about tongues as the, as the biggest force in manipulating the uh, geography, right? Um, uh, the, this, the charge of the Cross Species Adventure Club is to design food and food systems that actually improve environmental health, that increase measurably biodiversity. Um, and a charge that we can do, um, you saw the lures, um, Murkish Delight, a taste of wet landings you'll hear about, Viva Levitum. Oh, here, I'll give you the example of the um, Nano Water Buffalo ice cream, um, which takes, um, it's delicious. The Romans figured out that water buffalo milk was higher fat, higher protein, much more delicious, hence buffalo ricotta and buffalo mozzarella is, is you know, the high end. Um, it's, um, it's incredibly yummy. It makes a great ice cream. Um, with, when we use liquid nitrogen, it's got a lower embodied energy because we just freeze it in place. Um, and the nano-sized crystals you get from that process emphasizes the luxuriant creaminess of, of this. Um, but the, uh, the issue is that with um, developing or demonstrating the desire and the enjoyment of nano water buffalo ice cream, and I can tell you it's incredibly delicious, and a few people here who have tried it can also testify, is that um, we de develop a demand for water buffalo, right? Water buffalo, of course, demand Wetlands, constructed wetlands. Wetlands, we know, are the most critical ecosystem in uh, for sequestering carbon. Um, and when we combine them with dairy farmers, traditional dairy farmers, grass-fed uh, grass dairies, which dominate um, Vermont, for instance, um, where they spray the manure onto the, you know, in a good closed system, they spray the manure onto the, onto the grass, um, but then every rain event, it washes down into the aquatic ecosystem and nitrifies the aquatic ecosystem, denitrifies the terrestrial ecosystem. This is one of the big coupling drivers of, of um, climate change, right? Um, uh, constructing wetlands in low-value farmland, grazing water buffalo there, uh, not only radically improves the environmental performance of the dairy farm, but also their productivity. We get a delicious... Uh, nano water buffalo ice cream out of it. So we proposed this to Ben and Jerry's, and I think it's an interesting example of um, of the food systems because Ben and Jerry's is actually owned by Unilever, um, even though they do understand that it's a progressive social brand. And it was just launched launched in the UK last year, right? Is anybody impervious to the uh, Ben and Jerry's launch? In anyone not hear about it? There's one person who did about it. So they understand how to market this and they understand. But the interesting thing is going to them and saying, well, why don't you carry a line of water buffalo ice cream? Um, turns out they have a, a philanthropic arm that is dedicated uh, to exporting US-based dairy practices to India and Indonesia, which is water buffalo um, dependent um, uh, agroeconomies, um, as their philanthropy. So they're actually, it's an interesting mix of how our food systems don't make ecological sense and they don't make sense for our own health, um, but they could. Um, so these are simple hacks. Um, this is a, the, the, uh, the Cross Species Adventure Club is a supper club, so it's, uh, you know, well, it's illegal. Um, so uh, we, we print the invitations um, and we ask you to read them and to scan them and to then ingest them. Um, because we want to explore and demonstrate how to use ephemeral materials for ephemeral uses, like an invitation. Um, and this rice paper is quite delicious um, uh, and uh, demonstrates that we don't need to actually use these uh, municipal waste for, you know, the, the invitations, these catalogs, these, you know, that, uh, that have a very short lifespan and spend, you know, the next you know, 20, 30 years um, degrading in our landfills. Um, uh, here's another food uh, that is worth mentioning, um, uh, floss, uh, f not for free Libra open source 
software, but open source systems. Um, this is actually, and I have some at the workshop for you to taste, uh, based on, on isomalt, which is a the major ingredient in Metamucil. Anyone who has a slow bowel would know what Metamucil is. Anyway, it's a, isomalt is a sugar alcohol derived from beets, um, a sugar alternative that diabetics use. It's a optically clearer, competitive pastry chefs will use it. Um, but it makes a great floss, and when you um, dust it with bee pollen and put edible flowers in it and stick an LED in the middle, um, because the isomalt itself actually fosters biodiversity in your lower gut, right, is it doesn't give you a GI spike, and um, uh, effectively allows you to farm your lower gut, we start exploring the very real internal and external geographies of our food systems. Um, so... Uh, there's some isomalt downstairs. Again, I've got these a little bit out of order. I'm going to show you a few projects from um, the uh, Civic Action exhibition, um, which is um, was uh, last year in summer in Socrates Sculpture Park, where the Environmental Health Clinic was commissioned to develop an urban plan for um, Long Island City, a very interesting um, chunk of New York City that... Um, is of course on the water um, and has um, many interesting characteristics, a very active arts community. Um, I want to um, start with this one because one of the things that characterizes our urban biodiversity and our, uh, oh, you know what, I missed one. I'm, at some point I'm gonna tell you about mussels too because they're the future of food. Um, but, I'll, uh, but we're gonna skip to, um, uh, to um, this idea that urban biodiversity, you know, is, is in fact, there was a great study in, in France by the UNDP um, that they, uh, citizen science project, they measured the insects in metropolitan Paris and the surrounding farmlands, right? And we know that the French are very good at keeping the culture and agriculture. So um, what they found, this was 2010, which was the year of biodiversity, if you missed it, um, is that uh, the... Uh, insects, the pollinators, were three times more prevalent in uh, metropolitan Paris than in the surrounding farmlands, right? Just as a measure, our urban, our, uh, urban contexts are real islands of biodiversity. And they're characterized by these kind of fractured, um, uh, un disconnected little habitats that we could easily uh, mend and change our, the performance, the environmental performance of our urban systems. This is one example, the butterfly bridge, um, which uh, is simply taking, um, providing safe passage between one habitat patch and another habitat patch. Um, the idea is that um, instead of being smeared on your windscreen, we provide uh, a butterfly bridge, which is butterfly attracting plants planted um, along so the butterflies are attracted and then bounce along to safety to the next, um, to the next context. Um, here we have it. Um, um, another example of this is, um, let me go to the web page to show you, um, is the um, Salamander Superhighway. Um, so salamanders are really interesting organisms, fascinating to me as an Australian where they don't exist, but here and um, in the verdant northeast in these moist, um, strange, uh, counterintuitive uh, environments, they, they are the base of the food, uh, food network, the entire uh, uh, ecosystem. Um, in the US, the interesting thing is that salamanders, if you rolled them into a, frogs and salamanders, right, if you rolled them into a ball, um, and then rolled all the vertebrate mammals, all the you know squirrels and and mice and uh, deer, and into a, a ball. The ball of biomass flesh of amphibians would be twice the size of the vertebrate mammals, right? Which is a phenomenal um, way to think through the amount of energy transfer that 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 involves the the, um, the structure of our. Um, food network of our urban ecosystem. So um, salamanders here in this case, I think I've got some better pictures in this one, but anyway. Salamander crossing, again, it provides safe passage, a little micro speed bump that connects one patch of habitat to another patch of habitat. These are migratory animals. Um, and they, um, uh, they're, you know, the 
as you drive over it, the little bump reminds you that we are not alone. Um, and uh, any creature who goes through this, um, this salamander superhighway, there's a little PIR sensor in there that triggers a tweet to say, you know, hi, honey, I'm coming home. Um, or in the case of, um, of Socrates, um, it was a Socratic salamander who asked very important questions like, what comes first, the migration route or the salamander? Right. Hard and interesting and important questions um, posed by our salamander friends. Um, so let me see. Where are we? Yeah. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the um, uh, the moth cinema. I thought I had some. Um, and again, I, um, these instantiations are, um, I think, interesting to look at. Um, as experiments, right, of what our urban ecosystems could look like. So this is a silver screen that hangs in the, um, suspended in the park, um, and in front of it is planted a moth-attracting garden, right, with um, nectar plants and provisions for the, mass, for the moths, right, because, you know, does anybody here not know that lights attract moths? We know this, right? And now we could design our urban ecosystems as if we know this, right? So instead of being, you know, fried and and you know killed, um, murdered by the thousands, these valuable pollinate, pollinators that are really critical to our, our urban ecosystems, right, um, are provided for. They are uh, nectars and um, so and and as they play out their nightly dramas, as they visit these different. Um, plants and, and incredible plants, moth attracting plants. Um, nicotimidy, right? Nicotine plant only turns its smell on at night, right? It's just ding, it, it's a most delicious smell. And then it's how does it do that, right? <laughs> how does it? Um, but anyway, these, um, the, as the moths bounce around and they play out their nightly dramas on the, um, on the screen, their love triangles, their, um, their uh, so we'd position them as. Kind of the new um, celebrities, um, their uh, dramas. But it does suggest, and that's what I want to use this for, not as a particular project, but we could, you know, our urban lights could very easily accommodate the pollinators that we depend on, right? We could do plantings associated with them, right? In every, and I would argue that we have the knowledge of the information about how these critical uh, pollinators, um, what they contribute to in the environmental services and, and perhaps even the responsibility. Um, this is the first lunar moth observed in New York City in Socrates Sculpture Park by Usman Haq. Um, uh, the first lunar moth observed in 40 years. Um, and um, uh, how did it get there? Well, it was provided for, but uh, you can mail order the eggs actually, so if you... <laughs> if you want them. Um, okay, um, let me jump back. Um, let me also show you um, uh, the tree office because these um, uh, co-working spaces have be, um, been an issue. Um, and I, th I think co-working spaces are real opportunities to really reimagine how we work, where we work, um, and how we want to work, right? So the tree office, we opened in Socrates... Um, sculpture Park, do I have some better pictures? Maybe not. Um, thanks, Keynote. <laughs> um, the tree office is um, a tree office, right? It's an office and a tree. It's not a tree house. It's a co-working space with high-speed internet, um, locally generated power, and a uh, nice room. Uh, in fact, I would argue it's the, it was the best office space in all of New York City with stretching views of Manhattan from Long Island City um, and, um, and delightful to work in, in the canopy of a tree. So you could, on the website, as you can see, you could just book your, um, your half hour, your special meeting, your seminar. Um, and of course, the conceit of it is that the, the tree um, in the civic action plan, the trees own themselves and the property they stand on, right? And there's, a, of course, a legal precedence for this in the US, um, and I think Heath Bunting and Irrational are exploring it in the UK. Um, but in the US in 1840, I think, 1840, um, uh, a guy who grew up with a tree, a white oak, um, loved it, and he 
said here, the eight foot around is for you, um, and willed it, the, tree, the land that the tree was on to itself. Um, unfortunately, about um, uh, 50 years later, the tree died, um, and the ladies, junior ladies gardening club replanted a, an acorn from the tree um, in the same eight foot lot, um, testing heritability laws and demonstrating that the tree did actually own the property. In, in many ways, fulfilled the legal requirements of being a, a landlord. And that makes sense, right? Trees as landlords. There's something really sensible about that. So when you actually book your office space, you, um, uh, you, you pay uh, a small fee to the tree. Of course, the tree spends its profits and its own interests, which might be um, biochar augmentation of its the soil around it, or um, companion planting, or in, in fact, in this case, sending its offspring off to college. You know, as, uh, so we sp uh, sent a, one of the people who worked over there in the summer was from Cornell, another one was from Rutgers. Um, so they took saplings and planted them. Um, okay, so, so the idea that we could actually change our, how we understand urban parks as places where there's strict strictures of leisure, um, where you can't work, they're non-productive spaces, right? And hence always under pressure from the more productive, high value um, real estate that we dedicate to um, working spaces. Um, they, um, we could uh, change the status of the tree from the service worker, and in the environmental services view, an urban tree is valued at about $400 for its lifetime, over its lifetime. For that is for the carbon sequestration, the air quality um, improvements, the stormwater capture, the, um, the shade, the uh, other things. $400 over its entire lifespan. It's a very low paid service worker. Right? <laughs> and that's the problem with the environmental services view that and ecologies are here to service us, right? And we can, of course, reimagine them. This is an exploration of this, where, in fact, the tree itself is generating revenue in its own interests, um, and we are um, uh, participating. Of course, with a, a, the, um, the tree knows you're there. So, again, another PIR sensor. Um, it's, uh, I don't know, it's, it was more enjoyable for me working with this landlord than any of the other landlords that I've actually experienced. And I got to know it much better. It was a much more personable relationship. So I advocate trees as landlords and really reimagining what it is to, um, to incorporate um, the value of um, urban ecosystems into our shared context. I'm going to show you... Um, quick, um, another couple of quick, proto no, you know what I've got to show you. Um, uh, because in Bristol, they're actually starting the biggest experiment in, in this right now. Um, just let me go here. Um, uh, the biochar, uh, sorry. The biochar marks the spot, biochar, sorry. Um, this is Socrates Sculpture Park, which is a reclaimed, it's a, sorry, it's a terribly, uh, can we, no. Um, can you see that big X there? Yeah. Um, that's actually, that X has been worked, um, biochar has been worked into it, which is a, um, a for those of you who aren't familiar with biochar, um, you can taste some uh, in the workshop later um, in open source cola. Um, uh, or what it's actually good for is taking cellulosic waste and incinerating it in a process called pyrolysis, which doesn't produce either particulates or, um, or uh, CO2. It's a more complete combustion, and you end up with a char, right? Um, uh, biochar is called that. I mean, it's charcoal, right? Um, in this grand old tradition of um, charcoal making in the UK that, um, that this builds on. But when you actually work it into soil, um, and that's why it's called biochar, because it's for soil augmentation. You sequestered that carbon for 5,000 years um, conservatively, maybe a million years, right? Uh, if you sequester carbon into forests, that's about 200, 300 years, right? So it's a good way. It's a 5,000-year urban plan, if you will. And, it, um, uh, and what's interesting about it is it augments the soil. Um, in an urban context, it seems to really 
break down urban contaminants, right? This, um, the brown fields that we call our parks, um, these post-industrial contexts which are um, contaminated with all sorts of VOCs and um, uh, benzene and, um, uh, you know, a, a soup of unknown um, interacting contaminants. Uh, what happens is the, bi the, the biochar seems to create luxury housing for diverse microbes, soil microbes. So each square centimeter of soil has about 100,000 uh, microorganisms. And this is their kind of luxury apartments for them, right? Different, uh, that retains water and allows them, you know, you throw that many organisms at these contaminants, these urban pollutants, they figure out how to break them down, how to um, make use of them, right? So um, by collaborating with these um, microorganisms, we see that they released a lot more nutrients and uh, this area um, uh, produces a um, tremendously, um, about 40% more growth and actually more biodiversity. In, in this public experiment that we did, um, it's, it's really, really critical in Australia and carbon depleted soils. It's, it's less interesting here because of it's such a carbon rich, verdant area, but the urban contaminants is where it really makes sense. And what it is, um, what we did at the um, Socrates and what I've been developing is the, um, the biochar barbecue and the biochar char, um, which is um, inviting people to bring their municipal waste, their, uh, their actually their, um, junk mail, right? Instead of delegating it to their city council who has a, another private contractor who trucks it off to somewhere else who might incinerate or do something with it, right? Let's figure out how we can use it locally and turn it into an opportunity and a micro enterprise. So um, we bring the, you bring your biochar, you bring your junk mail um, and we incinerate it in the um, biochar uh, oven, um, put a few bangers on the barbie as we do um, prawns, I don't know, what do you do here? You have sausages, I think, and eggs, I don't know. Put a barbecue and then we invite a salsa DJ and in fact, I was going to invite a salsa DJ here. Um, I, someone said yesterday that um, uh, London was a uh, world city. Um, I have to tell you, um, Manchester has better salsa and I think that's a very good measure. They've got three salsa studios but the salsa um, teacher couldn't come um, we put on the salsa DJ, we um, actually uh, do some salsa um, and we uh, have the barbecue and we do, uh, you can take home your biochar and experiment with it in your own way. So, um, so this really explores how we might, you know, if there's one silver bullet um, for addressing urban ecosystems in this project to reimagine how we use them, you know, it's the taking our waste stream and using it as something of value. Um, and so um, the embodied energy of trucking uh, waste is ridiculous. Um, so these are experiments that are just starting and we hope to continue them now in, um, in Bristol with the Rechar group and um, potentially here with your great salsa um, uh, scene. Um, and I wanted to jump quickly to then um, to this um, project called The Pharmacy, uh, which we can jump to. Maybe here. Um, pharmacy, because again, this is about, um, this is an uh, urban agriculture system that we've developed in the Environmental Health Clinic for um, vertical agriculture and um, an urban context, so it's a very inexpensive system, and um, we, how am I going for time, Jose? Five minutes, yes, I see, okay. Um, very inexpensive system that uh, I'll quickly go through, and then one thing on, um, uh, one example on transportation before we wrap up and um, introduce you to um, the lo local environmental health clinicians. Um, the pharmacy project, again, the charge is to not only produce delicious edibles inexpensively, um, collectively, but also to measurably improve environmental health, increase biodiversity, and, um, and in fact, uh, improve air quality. Um, so these are these ag bags that um, are Tyvek-based, Tyvek breathes, so it, um, it's a soil-based system. So effectively, any railing, parapet, 
double hung window can be turned into arable territory for growing uh, urban foods. And, uh, and I just a quick word about urban foods. I don't know the case here, but urban agriculture in New York has really taken an unfortunate turn. Well, I mean, the biggest criticism of it is that why invest in urban agriculture when you could invest in struggling rural communities seven miles up the Hudson or you know, just nearby? And of course, you don't design systems that way. You, um, um, you don't compete with your rural counterparts, and you can't, right? The, so you need high shoot-to-root ratio plants. You need plants that will um, deliver the air quality benefits because the only, the only demonstrated air quality improvement strategy is leaf area index, right? It's leaves that is the only known technology for improving air quality, right? Fortunately, they're pretty inexpensive to put places, and particularly if we use, take advantage of the vertical, um, excess vertical structure to do these. So I'll just quickly go through. The secret to um, what we uh, grow in the pharmacy is uh, flowers, edible flowers, which of course uh, provides for um, non-humans, pollinators, who. Um, and um, a high nutrition value, extremely high nutrition value, that tremendous color uh, signals the high lycopenes and uh, phytonutrients that is emblematic of our cultural shift from understanding food as energy and calories to food as nutrition, this nutrition-driven idea where the powerful antioxidants that are in um, uh, edible flowers um, and low calories are in fact what the urban body assaulted by urban contaminants is most in need of. So edible flowers are uh, where the action is. Um, you saw the floss um, and we'll taste a few um, and this afternoon in uh, rose cola which uh, I just I want to mention this one project here because um, Dan Hill talked about um, this uh, issue of dark matter. Um, this is a facade, a vertical um, urban uh, farm on, uh, on um, Postmaster's Gallery in Chelsea. Um, and for this, I was given a class one violation of building code, um, which is what they give to construction firms that kill people with cranes, right? That's a class one violation. Um, I was, uh, had to take it down um, at great expense and, of course, heartbreakingly, um, to get that much soil up there how do you get that much soil up there? It's a good question. Vertical agriculture means um, uh, repelling. Anyone like to repel? Um, vertical. Anyway, it's good fun, but it's still a lot of hard work. Um, and the judge, when I went to Department of Buildings Court, said, you know, I explained the project of pharmacy and how much we'd improved, um, you know, theoretically could improve the air quality and um, provide for uh, by, uh, by diverse organisms. Um, and uh, had her taste some nasturtiums, and um, and she was um, she was ah oh, this is really interesting, um, uh, but you didn't have the permit right the right permit and you don't need permits for trellises you don't need uh, permits for repointing bricks um, but apparently you need permits for urban agriculture but the problem is there isn't a permit for vertical agriculture. So, of course, I had to I pay. She gave me the minimum fine, but um, the way we're going forward with this now is to, um, you can get permits for advertising. So these are, this looks like vertical urban agriculture, but it's actually advertising. Um, and what we're advertising, we're still figuring that out. Um, I will um, uh, judge this um, later. I just wanted to show you, this is, um, this is one of the U farmers, urban agriculturists, um, who's, um, uh, uh, Muki, she's uh, got her railing. Um, and this is the beginning of a project that I, uh, we're just launching now called the, um, the Phenological Clock. You can see on here that it's marked on her bag. I'm sorry, these images are so dark. It's probably my fault. The, the um, January through December. So every time something blooms or leaves out, she marks it on the, on the, the bag here. Every time an insect visits this or a bird, um, they uh, they get marked on here. In fact, I use my um, ag bag. I put all my Google Calendar dates on there, my grant deadlines on here. I much prefer looking at my ag bag for my calendar than than um, my screen. Um, so, but this is actually kind of a way to think through and collect um, 
really um, important data because phenological shifts, when things bloom, are the most sensitive indicator of climate variability, uh, climate destabilization. Um, it's an interesting question of how and who collects that. Um, and um, I'm just going to skip through this. Um, but to show you, uh, we've uh, developed this into uh, a um, uh, what we're launching tonight, today at the workshop is a phenological clock um, that takes the available data from the um, uh, uh, that's the wrong slide that takes the available data from um, blooming phenological data that's available here. If you look at this watch, um, there is, or actually look at this cross-species table here. Oh, this is the Manchester one. Um, but here it is on a, thank you, keynote, cross-species table. And there's a cross-species table. It's actually marked on there um, where we actually are furnishing urban biodiversity. We're inviting non-humans to sit at the table with us. And we're putting this, this, this phenological chart on the table so that we can validate, sort of underscore those observations that we've all made of when something's blooming or when an insect visits a, uh, a flower. Okay, I'm going to finish off with one um, last project because I can't talk about um, um, but why I have this up. Um, please come uh, to the workshop and meet. <sighs> Keynote is so. <laughs> um, thank you, Keynote. Um, one last project to uh, talk about really reimagining um, our urban ecosystems and, uh, sorry, our, our transportation systems. I think that we can rediscover the um, sport in transport. I think we can more radically reimagine how, what urban mobility is. Um, because do we have to distribute our foods in diesel trucks that give our kids asthma and compromise the cardiovascular health of each one of us? Can't we do something about that? Um, I'm going to uh, show you, these are actually some prosthetics for the imagination for, um, for those of us who want to reimagine flight systems as one way to do this. Um, you can see they're different bird forms, so you can test the you know, maneuverability and the angle of attack and um, why seagulls have such nice pointed wings and can't land on, you know, need big open beaches to land on. Um, here's, a, um, here's a squadron of the imaginary air force in training. Um, using their, there's actually a, this um, strap-on flight simulator, if you will. Um, there's actually a, a little iPhone app we wrote that's broken at the moment, but is a, um, a, if you will, a strap-on black box, so you can put it out the window, and it measures three-axis acceleration changes and a flight log that you can then upload. Um, and then when you've kind of explored and reimagined this kind of mobility, you can strap on these 16-foot uh, wingspan wings. And if Steve Dietz is on the audience, this is a project commissioned for San Jose um, Biennial. Um, and you can practice a wet landing um, which is using wet landings as opposed to terrestrial landings. Wetlands, we need to incorporate them into our urban ecosystems. And you never have to level a wet landing, right? Um, uh, here is a Toronto project where we, um, this was in collaboration with Usman Haq, where flight path um, Toronto, where hundreds of people flew across downtown um, the Toronto's um, Nathan Phillips Square and past City Hall. This is the autopilot license. Of course, you uh, sign your own autopilot license after a, a test. Um, and I have to tell you that our grandmothers were the most um, enthusiastic flyers. Um, and let's see if this video will play. Some video playing. That's the graduation ceremony. Um, but what we have produced here was, um, I would argue, a... Um, a shared public memory of a possible future. People were experimenting with, you know, a playful, the, you know, the angle of attack, the sort of gentle lift phenomena of flying. You weren't sitting like a uh, sack of potatoes on this zip line. You were exploring what fast, inexpensive, emissionless mobility could look like, right? Um, and it becomes much more feasible then to talk about... Um, uh, to talk about 
um, distribution sites for different ways to distribute um, goods, which I'll finish with um, for um, this project, which is um, a quick diagram of, of elevating elevators. Um, uh, we take the elevator shaft and we uh, extend it 30% higher than the building. Um, <clears throat> this, of course, um, produces you know, a glass box on a building which heats up the greenhouse effect to address the greenhouse effect, right? Heats up. The um, hotter you vent it out, you have to do some finagling with fire code because they like to isolate um, these shafts. And we, uh, we, you know, we know that passive circulation, um, the shaft effect is what architects have used through millennia um, before fire code came into existence. But by sh venting it out, the hot air rises. That pulls air through. The 30% shift allows us to um, circulate air passively. In New York City, about 80% of the um, carbon footprint is from HVAC systems and, and buildings, building-related. Um, and so we can take uh, you know, a case like Tomcat Bakery, which is... Um, 76 trucks every morning delivering fresh artisanal bread all over Long Island City um, and New York City and beyond, um, and 76 trucks worth of diesel fumes to Long Island City residents, or Fresh Direct, which is another company, 7,000 deliveries a day, again, out of Long Island City, um, concentrated there. We can, in fact, um, take those, those goods and um, use the elevator because... An extended elevator not only produces a view, not only produces passive circulation, but produces access to the roof, the new territory for urban reimagination. Um, we can start to distribute goods the three blocks down to the, um, to the river, where seven times more efficient transportation on water, which of course is the raison d'etre for building cities on water, and that we could and should use. So we can start to distribute goods um, in a much more interesting um, and playful way. And with that, I just want to um, uh, say that I, you know, it's, it's uh, tremendous to be part of um, what I think is a, a social movement, the food movement, the uh, new media uh, experiments um, that really seek to more radically rethink um, our shared urban context, and to formulate the problem not as something that's too wicked to solve or too complex or too overwhelming or too big or too hard, um, but in our own interests, you know, that we can, and I would argue will, redesign our urban ecosystems in, to produce shared environmental health. Um, and with that, I'd like to introduce Zoe, um, and, well, and we'll go downstairs to talk uh, upstairs, sorry. Jose will, Jose <laughs> Luis will, tell, will direct us. But um, uh, final words is the measure of a city is what it measures. Thank you.